Hello, everyone. It's Chris Littlefield from Beyond Thank You. I'm excited that you're joining all today and excited to have Amy Gallo, who's a contributing editor at Harvard Business Review, co-host of the Women at Work podcast and author of the HBR Guide for Dealing with Conflict and her soon to be released book, Getting Along, How to Work with Anyone. Amy, thanks for joining today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Excited to talk with you. And one thing that I haven't shared with you prior to us talking is you are kind of my HBR hero. So as somebody oh who gosh. writes, I know, and I know I'll make you blush when I say this, <laughs> is you cannot go on to HBR and go to the most popular articles without seeing one of your pieces there. There's mm. always one within the top five articles. And when I was thinking about why is this, and it's similar to my experience with your book, is that you have this amazing ability to take some complicated thing or something that people perceive as extremely complicated, break it down into pieces that people can understand, make it simple, make it less scary, and then give people tools that they can use to actually address it. And so when I got your the copy of your book to read and look at and prepare, what I saw was the same experience I have every time I read one of your articles and picking up this book was just how you take something that is so difficult and so daunting for so many people and simplify it down to something that people can use. So thank you oh, for that. Thank, well, thank you. That is such a nice compliment. And it's it's interesting you say that because I just had, I was recording my audio book in Boston earlier this week and I was taking a lift back to the ferry to come home. And the lift driver asked me what I would do. We got into this whole conversation about writing. He said, oh, I'm more a mathematical person. And I said, you know, what's interesting, I think of writing as mathematics because it, or, or, it's a logical game. And what you described of taking these complicated ideas, there's research from neuroscience and research from management science, all written in these papers that are, you know, anyone who's had to deal with academic papers, no, they're really <laughs> dense, right? And I see it as a, a challenge, like it's my favorite challenge of like, how do I convey this in a way that people can take action now they don't have to think they don't have to apply the theory to their life they can just take action now so such a nice compliment thank you for recognizing that that's awesome it is and it's simplifying it down to pieces so you had already written a book on dealing with conflict mm -hmm. so what prompted you to write this book what well, was actually the reaction to that first book so i that book came out in 2017 i started doing talks and workshops based on it and that book is a you know practical straightforward approach to dealing with any sort of conflict. Yeah. But what I would notice is that whenever I gave these talks or did these workshops, inevitably I would get a question that said, you know, that's useful. I can use this framework, but I have this one coworker. And they would describe someone who sort of defied the norm mm -hmm. in terms of how we interact at work or, you know, was was presenting particularly difficult behavior. And I soon realized like this generic framework that I offered in the guide, which I still believe is really valuable, yeah. didn't work in every circumstance. And so I started one to I wanted to see if I could help those questioners, you know, the people who are asking those questions you know, is there specific advice about how to deal with specific types of personalities or specific types of behavior? And lo and behold, there's lots of advice about out there about how to deal with some of the more challenging, what I call in the book, archetypes. I love it. And I love that what you just acknowledged, there's this element of like, yeah, this, this should work in theory, but you haven't met my boss. Exactly. <laughs> this works in, in theory, but you haven't met my spouse, yeah. right? Because I think it's right. so much of what you're talking about, these personalities and archetypes that you that you bring up, I think so much of the book also applies at home as well, right? Yes. That, that oh, every, with neighbors, with, yes, with, with every, like I, my husband always says, like, your advice just applies to group texts. Like any group text contention that comes up, he's like, I just think about your framework. So it's like, yes, but yeah, and spouse, children, teenagers, friends, all of it. Yeah, exactly. So inside of this, so you, you chose to write this book to be able to dig in. And one thing that I love in the book, and I think you just shared it right there is this element of sharing the examples of the concrete behaviors of each one of these different archetypes. Mm -hmm. archetype, I always pronounce this wrong. Archetype, is that right? I call it archetype. I think Arch that's the archetype. correct. Yeah. Archetype. Yeah. 
I better yeah. look that up. So I, I, I think right, you're, yeah. you're, you're clearly right. And I just hear it mm -hmm. like many times I make up words. So <laughs> archetypes. So you in sharing these concrete examples of this for people. So one, before we even dig into those, I'd love to hear, you know, why are these behaviors or why are these coworkers that people are struggling with? Why do they have such an impact over emotions? Why is it when somebody, you know, I, I had an experience not so long ago that when I was reading one of your examples in the book, I was like, that's me. I just <laughs> had that experience where somebody said something to me around a speaking engagement and they didn't like the fee that I was asking. It was like, I thought that you didn't care about money. <laughs> right. And I was like, that's right. Wow. That's right. And I spent four yeah. days thinking about this yeah. as it was sitting there. And I was like, how could that happen? So why do these, these interactions with that, with the, with the, you know, passive aggressive peer, or the know-it-all department head, why do they weigh yeah. so heavily on us? Well, there, there are some good reasons. And I'll tell you, you are not, I mean, I'm a conflict expert and I still have those experience. I mean, I had this happen last month where there was just a simple, it was a negotiation over a fee and it, it stuck with me. It, you know, the, and the person I was negotiating with set, implied some things that were not nice about me. Same thing, right? Like you care too much about money or you're too greedy, you know, and, and it stuck with me for days and days. And I still, I actually was thinking about it yesterday and it still was bothering me. So a couple reasons. Number one, we, when we have friction with someone else, we perceive it as a threat and it might be a threat to our identity, who we are. It might be a threat to um, our sense of harmony in the workplace, the idea that we'll get along, right? It might be a sense a threat to our career or to our resources. And when our brain or body perceives a threat, we go into fight or flight. And it doesn't matter if it's, you know, uh, something that's really truly threatening. So let's say a bear chasing you down, or if it's not getting your way on the project plan, or a snarky email that you receive. Right there, our body responds in the in the same way, and it gets stuck on that story of what we think is happening. And you know, we have a negativity bias as humans. We tend to focus more on negative events than we do on positive ones. And that's why the news is full of negative events because we it draws our attention, right? Um, even though we know there are good things going on in the world sometimes. Um, so, you know, that's a big, big piece of it. Another piece of it is that when someone in particular dealing with someone who is difficult or we conceive of as difficult, you know, it's, it's a challenging our sense of self, like your example of, you know, being accused of, I thought you didn't care about money. You're then forced to think, wait, wait, I am someone, wait, or am I someone who cares about money? Am I not like, right. It starts to challenge who, who we are and yeah. it violates the norm. So we expect at least in, in the U S and cl different cultures have different tolerances for, um, confrontation. But in the US, we tend to generally think we're going to interact with colleagues or partners or clients in a you know genial way that we're going to actually get along. And so when that doesn't happen, we're like, what, what, you know, our alert goes up, we get back into that fight or flight, and we just start to ruminate. Yeah. And that, that element of surprise that comes up where I didn't expect that. And yes. I didn't expect that person to react that way. You know, and, and I'm thinking about so many times when this happens, either with coaching clients or personally, uh, daily, weekly with my kid, my wife, my clients or whatever, yeah. but all of a sudden that triggers in. And then it's like, wait a second, why did that just happen? What they just said or what they just did doesn't align with how I felt I was showing up in that experience. Exactly. And then there's that friction between how I felt I came across or my intention and the impact or the reaction the person had on it. That's right. And actually Sheila Heen, who, you know, um, studies feedback, she, she has this, I, th I think it's either a Ted talk, but there, there, I saw this video of her describing the feedback and how bad we are at understanding exactly what you're describing, whether how others perceive us. And if you think about it, like when you look around a room, the only thing you cannot see, unless there's a mirror there, is you. And it it's a good metaphor for how horrible we are at interpreting how our behavior will be received. 
or how it will land with someone. And when we, when it doesn't land well, we've all been in this situation, <laughs> we presume it's because of them, right? It couldn't possibly mean, right? And I think of the example of, of, you know, like being late to a meeting, like when I'm late to a meeting, I think, well, my last meeting ran over, um, mm -hmm. you know, this, this meeting started even a few minutes early, but when someone else is late, I'm like, well, they're rude, like they're, or they're disorganized or right. Like we attribute it to them as a person, as opposed to all the circumstances that likely led them to be late. 100%. I, I used to be one of those trainers when I was running workshops that I would make people sing a song if they were late or make <laughs> jokes, you know, that whole thing. And I, and I worked in the Middle East for a long time. So there was always the excuse of being late. Like people would be half hour, 45 minutes late until one day somebody was late because of a family crisis when their kid got hurt. Mm. And when I made that joke and then I promised myself, I'm never going to do that because I had no clue what that person was dealing with before. Yes. Now, if this is a colleague who's always, you know, late and there's other things going on, that's different. But I realized, Hey, we never know what, what's going on. Yeah. And one thing, what you just shared, Amy. So, so my, I think I may have shared with you before my background's conflict resolution. And so when we, yeah. a mentor of mine, when we were running, I used to run cross-border dialogue programs, bringing people from either side of Israel, Palestine or India, Pakistan, or mostly worked in Armenia, Azerbaijan. And so one of the people, a mentor of mine used to say, and I remember this slide because we shared in every workshop is that 90% of conflict resolution is understanding the other side's point of view. Now, reading your book, it shifted my perspective on that hmm. because it shifted it because I always thought about it's 90% is understanding the other side's point of view. But what I got at looking at your book and reading it is that part of that 90% is understanding our point of view about their point of view. Yes. And that was the part that has been missing in this equation because we can understand their perspective. Mm -hmm. But if we don't understand our role or what we're doing, so how do you get people who, who are in this interaction with a coworker, regardless of the archetype mm -hmm. that they are <laughs> first, how do you get them to first make that shift? So here I am and I'm feeling all these emotions. Mm -hmm. I have all this stuff going on for me. It's triggering my head. I'm angry. I'm, I'm fighting with them in the car and they're not in the car with me. <laughs> Right, or I'm angry right. that I'm laying in bed thinking about them or not being able to sleep or, or getting ready to write that pissed off email, excuse my language, mm -hmm. about what they just did and how they're so wrong and shaming them. How do you shift from being on that freight train to, <laughs> to, to nowhere to yeah. hop out of that first in general? Yeah. I mean, I think some of it is empathy, right? So trying to ask questions about why do you think they behave that way? Um, what's a, if, if you were to assume there's a rational explanation for their behavior, what would you, what would you come up with? What would that rational explanation be? So it is about seeing their perspective to some degree, but it's also about understanding your own reaction to that behavior, right? So what, what about someone behaving like a know-it-all? What about someone being pessimistic about this project is upsetting to you? Right. And, and it's, and I, you know, one of my favorite things is when I talk to clients or, you know, attendees of a talk or a workshop, I give the, those, they want to describe someone's behavior and they want to say, isn't that inappropriate? Right. And lots of times I do, you know, I'm like, yeah, that sounds inappropriate. But the reality is that person doesn't think it's inappropriate. So you have to rethink your mm. perspective on it because you're not going to reach into their brain, rewire them to see the world the exact same way you do, right? We're, we There are often multiple interpretations of behavior that are equally valid. So, you know, I, you know, I also think we also need to understand that we're hurt by that behavior. So when someone is a pass, you know, a chronic pessimist who's constantly turning down your ideas in front of others, like that's painful, right? And and it feels like okay, I can't make progress. So we also have to validate those feelings because I think one of the, you know, hamster wheel moments I have often is. Um, you know, someone does something and I think, well, that's wrong. And then I'm like, oh no, wait, wait, maybe I'm wrong to interpret it that way. No, they're wrong. No, I'm wrong. You know, and so you're sort of just going around in the circle of like who's wrong. And they're like, whoa, hold on. You know, 
maybe no one's wrong. Maybe they're doing that and it triggers this in me. And then I then further trigger that in them. And then we become polarized. You're a pessimist and I'm an optimist and we'll never get along, right? What if we just stopped for a moment and said, it's normal to feel upset by that behavior and it's normal for them to behave that way. Okay, so let's figure out how can we address the dynamic, not our personalities. And, you know, we all show up with all this baggage. You're not, unless you're going to give your, your coworker a prescription for therapy, which I don't recommend, right? You're not going to cure <laughs> the baby all... a trigger. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. That is not one of the tips in the book, by the way, is no, to give them a prescription for therapy. But yeah, you're not going to be able to unpack it all. So you're going to have to focus on how do we improve the dynamic? How do we move forward in a way that we both can feel good about? So how does somebody make that shift? So here I am, I'm ruminating, right? Mm -hmm. My mind's going, my heart's racing, I'm amped up, I'm triggered. I'm sitting there coming up with a perfect response to what Amy just said to me in that last meeting that was condescending. Yeah. How do I turn from being in that to making that mental shift? What is that yeah. first step to go um, from that triggered response to all of a sudden triggering that self-reflection or empathy. Yeah. So I think, well, one, make sure your like basic needs are taken, like that you've slept well, that you're hydrated, right? We have to be in our right minds to do this work because it's really, and recognize when you're not, you know, the, I had an incident last month, you know, where I was really worked up and I realized I'm just, I'm depleted. I'm depleted from everything going on in my life. I'm not going to be in my best frame of mind, right? I need to give myself some space until I until I actually feel well in order to do this work. The other thing I the the trick that really works for me is to is that when I start to feel certain and you can almost feel it I feel it as like a narrowing of my vision, right? Like I'm like I'm so right about this. That's and you start to lose the periphery as I just say, "Okay, wait. What don't I know?" And start to explore, like you really have to shift to a curious mindset. Mindset. What don't I know about this situation? I think I know everything, but I clearly don't. So what don't I know? And sometimes that requires a conversation with a good friend who's going to push you, not tell you, oh, you're right, they're awful, you know, but who's going to push you to sort of try to see it a different way. I'm a big fan of talking things out with people I trust. Um, but some people, you know, it ha it's also has to be internal of can you switch from the I know exactly what's going on to there's lots I don't know and can I be curious? And that starts building the space to do all that other work. It's creating, I love that, that idea of slowing down first, checking and taking care of our mental health. Did I get sleep? Did I get water? Did I, you know, my, my daughter the other day being like, puppy, you need to rest. You are grumpy. <laughs> Right, I have a six-year-old. She was probably right. Yeah. right. After four yeah. hours, but I can't see it because I'm in it. But that yeah. reminder is like, yes, I do, and I can't mm -hmm. have a break till you go to bed. <laughs> so that's right, go to bed. But that realizing I don't have the physical or mental capacity to process this right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So what do I need yeah. to do? I need to refill the tank, check in what's going on, and then what I hear you saying too is then getting in communication with somebody who is, and I love, I heard you make the distinction between the person who's just going to support your view and the mm -hmm. person who's going to support you to reflect and challenge your view. Yeah. Well, and I have, I know exactly, I mean, I won't name them, but I have two friends. I have the friend who I know when I call, she will tell me I'm right and she'll validate and she'll, and I'm like, they feel so good. And sometimes that's what I want. But when I'm dealing with a challenging situation with someone else, that's not helpful. And I have another friend who I know will be like, well, you know, have you thought about this? Or like, you can be sort of pushy. Maybe that's what was, you know, who just sort of put, encourages me to be a little bit, um, you know, more curious about the situation. So no, yes, know who you're, know who you're reaching out to, who you're venting to and yeah. the circumstances. And so one thing I'm really curious about is you have these amazing, you know, eight, or am I just getting a mix of eight? Eight, yep. Eight yep. archetypes. How did you how did you develop these? How did you come mm -hmm. to find these were the most common ones that people were dealing with? Yeah. So this was the um they started by I'll tell you the first one that I came that really came to me was the passive aggressive peer because that's the one 
in, I can almost time it. It's the first or second question after a talk, someone will say, how do you deal with someone who's passive aggressive, right? It's just, it is one of the behaviors that's so vexing to, to handle. So that was sort of the first one. And I actually thought, I'm like, maybe I'm just writing a book about how to deal with passive aggressive people in the office. But then I realized there were lots of other behaviors that were that were problematic. Now, the model is not mutually exclusive. There are people who fit in multiple of those categories. There are also people who defy any of those categories. There are, uh, there are other books that explore other archetypes of difficult people as well. Um, but really, these are the ones that I was hearing about most often. I did a lot of surveys in leading up to the writing of the book. Um, you know, conversations on LinkedIn with folks just asking, you know, who who they have to deal with most often. And these were the ones that really just kept coming up over and over. I also, to be fair, wanted to give people um, solutions. So I also made sure that any of the archetypes I chose actually had research-based tactics that people could implement, right? So there weren't, I didn't want to include any that were just really incredible you know, impossible to deal with. Although I would argue there's probably, you can always deal with someone, but anyway, that that's, another that's, where, that's where you and I are the same is that there's always, there's always a solution, right? There's always a yes. conversation. There's always something we can let go of. That's going to create space for somebody. And then yeah. there are also points where it's just, you know, letting go is how we create that space. That's right. And you, the question you ask yourself when you're, when you are trying to deal with someone who feels impossible to use that word is where, you know, the law of diminishing returns and, and are you putting so much empathy and curiosity into this, that you're actually damaging your own well being? And that's, I mean, I, some of the stories I heard for the book, I was like, the best solution here is for you to quit, right? The best solution for you is to get out of this relationship, right? And that is true. Sometimes it, you do need to end, the, you know, get out or, or dimin you know, reduce the amount of time you interact with that person because you, the, what you're trying isn't working. Yeah, I had a, I had a client that I, I was working with who reached out to me, funny enough, off of one of my HBR articles because the could, person couldn't accept compliments. And it was ah, specifically around accepting compliments. Yeah. And it's funny, it didn't actually have anything to do with that. But then as we started talking, and then after a bit of time working with them, realized that like six people within the organization were all struggling with this one person. And mm. so much time and energy. And it's like there almost needs to be a gauge of... How much energy are we spending working with this one individual? Right. Right. Yep. And then when is there a point where we decide, hey, you know what? This is because one thing I think is really interesting, either with coaching clients, when you're advising somebody, then at mm -hmm. the same time, individually, where you, it's hard to decipher how much time you're investing in managing this behavior. How much energy are you giving? Because mm -hmm. the more you get tired the more you don't have the ability to, or at least for me personally, I struggle to be able to ha generate empathy when I'm finding that I'm just like, I got yes. nothing left. You're right. Well, and there's research that backs that up, right? Like you just, you can't, it is very difficult. We don't feel empathy for others when we're tired, when we're exhausted, right? It's just so much more, it takes cognitive resources to imagine yourself into someone else's shoes and you just can't do it when you're, when you're depleted. Yeah. So I mean, what if somebody has both of these? So some of these, just to be able to list them off here for people yeah. who are watching to share is the insecure boss, the pessimist, the victim, the passive aggressive peer, the know-it-all, the tormentor, the biased coworker, and the political operator. So what happens when, you know, We've got this person who we absolutely love working with. Uh, that was a you know passive aggressive comment. <laughs> uh, that person is both the biased operator and the pessimist. Mm -hmm. you know, we have these multiple different things. What do we do in that case? Yeah. So read both chapters to start there. But what one of the things that is critical to the book and to into dealing, I think, in and with any difficult relationship is to not think that or not believe that you're gonna do one thing and it's gonna transform everything, right? This this is I like to think of you know, transforming 
forming the dynamic as an experiment and you're trying different tactics along the way. So for example, if someone, you know, falls into those two categories, you might look at the tactics outlined in that, in that book and decide, okay, I'm going to try this one for two weeks. I'm going to see how it goes. I'm going to take notes. I'm going to note what works, what doesn't, and then I'm going to try something else. And one of the most frustrating things that I hear about this a lot is that sometimes you do something and it works and you're like, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, we're actually, we're communicating well. He's not being passive aggressive, right? This is all working out really well. Um, and then three weeks later, they go back and revert to the same behavior or six months later, or, and you think, wait, wait, no, no, it was working. What happened? And so again, you have to think of it as an experiment where you're trying out different tactics, taking note of what works, adjusting your approach, trying something else and recognizing that this is not typically, I wish like a one and done intervention. This is a dynamic you're continually working on because, you know, to our earlier conversation, it takes two to tango. So you're bringing your own junk to the to the dynamic, just like they're bringing it. Yeah, it's it just as you were sharing that, it's just that reminder that that the culture and our relationships are a dialogue, not an outcome. Yes, right. right. It's oh, something that's that. ongoing. And and I I remembering a uh, a friend's, you know, talking about her kid. Like I just told him not to do this thing, and he keeps on doing it. I'm like. <laughs> Well, do you listen when people tell you when your when your spouse says don't do this? Do you ever do it again? Well, yes. Well, guess what they are too. And this reminder right. that it's like what came to me as you were sharing that is that we're also pay, have to pay attention and manage other people's hydration, other people's mm. sleep, other people's workload, right? Like if I think right. about, you know, losing weight and gaining weight and staying fit, right? Like the concepts are easy. Yeah. Eat, you know, eat less, exercise more, getting myself to do it. It wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar industry, right? That's if right. everybody just read the book and did it, right? We have to maintain those relationships over time. That's right. Well, and that's you that I'm so glad you brought up the that sort of behavioral change concept because I think one of the other things I sometimes people will say when you're you know, someone will ask, for example, how do I deal with the passive aggressive coworker? And I share a couple of tips. And then someone says, well, you just have to tell them to stop. And I say, okay, well, number one, that would require this self-awareness that they are actually behaving passive aggressively. Yeah. And then two, you do really think telling them to stop is going to make them stop. Like to your point, like I can dedicate myself to eating well, but that does not mean I'm not going to have ice cream tonight. Right? Like it, it's, we, our commitment does not mean that the behavior is going to naturally follow. Yeah. And there's that element of building it. You know, I, there's a, I was running a workshop with the team at the UN and I remember one interaction around conflict that just, it, it just shifted my whole framework. And it was a boss who was a yeller. Mm -hmm. Come back from meetings to her assistant and would just be like, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And she goes, and I'm like, well, what are you doing that thing? She goes, well, I just let her go in and cool off. I'm like, I know she cares about me. I know because we get lunch together, we spend time together. And I know that she just got yelled at from her boss. And because we have enough of a relationship, when she does get upset, I don't take it personally anymore. Mm. And it's that reminder that many of these behaviors, right? That yes, once we resolve them, we also have to continue to build those relationships to maintain them. So when they do fall apart, when we do lose our cool, when somebody, you know, falls off the wagon, I guess, in the relationship, I guess, is a, I don't know if that's an appropriate yeah. analogy to use, then we have enough relationship built up to be able to understand that this is not them just, oh, see, they are this way to, right. oh, you know what, they're tired right now. That's right. Right. That's classic giving the person the benefit of the doubt, right? Is And I think you know, that, that boss you described would fit the tormentor archetype really well of like someone who you think should be a mentor. They're, they're your boss. Or you share some identity factor with them. Maybe it's a, another woman in an organization where that's, that's a male dominated field, right? You think they're going to help you. And instead they're actually make your life miserable. And the, the reality is, is that 
I, I have rarely seen someone who is, behaves that way all the time, right? That they're a yeller every single day, day in and day out. There are probably softer edges to them, but yet we start with the confirmation bias of, I don't like being yelled at. So anytime she starts to raise her voice, I'm going to see that behavior. As, and instead of as this very self-aware, emotionally intelligent person you were interacting with saw, which is like, oh, well, that's an aberration, right? Like normally this is what our relationship is like. And so focusing on what's more typical, um, focusing on the more positive aspects of the relationship, I think can really help. Again, no one should have to be yelled at at work, but it sounds like that person found a way to deal with it. Well, and I think in the situation, what was different about that one, and there's 200 other people in that same same boat who they only get the yells, is what that manager had done. And I always think this is the part and so important is she had built up the relationship with this person over time. So when there were mm-hmm. breakdowns, there was enough in the tank already. So it only yes. leveled it to here opposed to draining it. That's and I think right. many of the situations that we're talking about here is there is no relationship. Mm-hmm. So all right. I'm getting is this behavior. And so all yeah. I have to work on is that. So yeah. what are your recommendations? So here's, here's you know, I have people who are, are going to be watching this who may have any one of these different archetypes that they're mm-hmm. dealing with. How does somebody first identify what it is? And then what are the first steps that you'd recommend they take? Other than, of course, buying your book and reading it, which they're all going to. Yep. So what, thank you for that. Yes. Um, So, you know, in the, and, and for those who don't buy the book, I will, you know, there are other things you can do, but let me just say for those who do, there is an appendix in the book where you can actually look at the list of behaviors and match those to the, to the archetype. So if you're not sure who you're, who you're dealing with that, that can help. But I think the first step absent of that tool is to, is to sit down and think through what are the behaviors that are presenting problems? Like what, what is the, um, you know, what are the the moments or the incidences or the situations where I am having a strong reaction and that the behaviors that I see are causing the most trouble? And then think about, okay, what, based on that, what, what would be, and I, I am careful with these archetypes because I don't want them to become diagnostic labels or pejorative comments about people, How come? you know, I just think that doesn't help. I mean, it doesn't, even in my head, if I sit here and think, well, Chris is a passive aggressive jerk. I then see that through the lens, everything you do, that smile, that was fake, right? Like you just start to interpret it all. You start to see their, the behavior through this negative lens. Um, Also, we just don't know what's going on with people. You, you can't, you can't decide someone's passive aggressive just because they've behaved passively aggressively a few times. The archetypes are meant to help you find the tools that will work for your situation, not for you to go, by the way, I figured out you're a pessimist and that's the court, you know, the source of all our negative interactions. And now if you could just stop being pessimistic, everything would be fine. Right. You don't, you don't want to use those labels. So think about, okay, who am I dealing with? And then I think it, it helps. And I do this in the book is to think about what typically motivates that that behavior. So passive aggressive behavior is a perfectly good one. I think we often assign really malicious intentions to that behavior, but when reality, in reality, it's often a fear of something. It's a fear of rejection, a fear of conflict, a fear of failing, right? And so if you can think about what could possibly be motivating my colleague and not in a, you don't have to be exactly right. It's just, again, trying to sort of loosen your certainty so that you can be a little more curious. Once you're a little more curious, you put yourself in their shoes, then you can start to implement the tactics. So for example, with passive aggressive behavior, one of the tactics, oftentimes they're set telling you something, let's say they're behave, you know, behaving passive aggressively because they're afraid of conflict. They don't want to tell you that they're not actually going to do that thing you've asked them to do in the meeting. So they say yes and nod and smile, and then they don't do it. And maybe even talk behind your back, right? So then, but what, what they're actually trying to tell you is I don't feel comfortable doing this, but now you have to deal with this sort of 
bad behavior that that message, I don't feel comfortable doing this is wrapped around. So one of the tactics is to really try to think, what's the message they're trying to convey? And then to do a little bit of hypothesis testing, which is, you know, I, I get the sense you don't feel super comfortable with the way this project is going or with the role I've asked you to play in this project. Is that right? And with a passive aggressive person, you might get, no, that's not right. All good. Right. But you sort of continue to do that, continue to make it safe for them to admit how they actually think and feel, show them that it's okay to, to be a little more direct. And I, you start to see a little bit of, of progress, you know, with the passive aggressive peer, also, you might need to use some team norms, a little bit of positive peer pressure of, yeah. Okay, as a team, we're going to agree when we commit to doing something in a meeting, we're going to do it. If we're not able to, we will email the person afterwards, right? You, you can start to, to really establish the, the mode of operating on the team so that when they behave that way, it's not just problematic for you, but it's violating a team agreement that others can then say, well, we agreed. You're not, you're not adhering to that. I love what you said there about being able to step back from it for a second to then look at where may this behavior be coming from. Mm -hmm. So digging from the position down to the interest or need that's there. That's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. Pulling that's that right. out. And especially in, in the, the climate that we're in right now, at least in the U S where everybody's expressing positions and everything's a trigger, right? I shouldn't be using allness as my, you know, college communication teacher said, but <laughs> right? it, it's like just that, that triggering and then understanding that that communication of that, well, that was a great idea or yeah, sure. I'll do that. I won't, you know, mm -hmm. whatever that little comment is actually a cry for help or support or someone acknowledging the fact that I don't know how to communicate about this. Yeah. Or an expression of powerlessness. I mean, that's the other thing that I really try to pay attention in, to into the book is that is that a lot of time our perception of difficult behavior is by is is you know laden with bias. So someone who I see as difficult might be from a different culture in which that behavior is normal. You know, passive aggressiveness. Oftentimes, it's people who come from from traditionally underestimated groups who don't have the power to be direct, to, you know, to, to say no, right? There's too much at stake to that for that. And so we have to remember that not only how we perceive, you know, the behavior can likely be biased, but also then the tactics that each person is allowed to use mm -hmm. is going to be different. So what you can do um, you know, as a man might be different than what I can do as a woman, what I can do as a white woman might be different than what my black female colleague can do in terms of addressing these behaviors. And that's critical to keep in mind. Yeah. And then it, it also reminds me about the importance of creating alternative ways to communicate within our organizations, you know, so for that person who's passive aggressive, you know, I'm just thinking of a, of a coaching client who came up and said, my boss doesn't give me feedback, but he tells me I'm doing things wrong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that importance of saying, I was like, hey, one thing, have you tried, right? Because this is the new boss and it's the first time managing, right? It's like when I ask for feedback directly, they're uncomfortable responding on the spot. That's so right. You considered actually sending the request, hey, do you want to give me feedback verbally or do you want to write it out and send it to me instead? Yeah. To be able to say, hey, I don't know how to communicate this, but I don't like this. Yeah. You need time yeah. to think about it and process it where some people are like just, get my face. Let me tell me what's going on. Like, yeah. let's, let's, let's rally. Like, let's, mm -hmm. let's have this conversation. Yeah. Right. And I'm most thinking of my, I had a Russian, well, Armenian, uh, but grew up under Russian, Russian control in Armenia who would mm. talk to me and go, Chris, why are you doing <laughs> that? And at first I was like, you got to back off. But then I realized he was literally asking, why are you doing that? <laughs> that was just the communication style because it's very yes. direct. And then once I understood that, I realized, wow, he's actually asking for my input, not telling me I'm doing something wrong. I was reading right. to a level of communication where he was committed to us communicating better. Yes, that's right. That's I right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think about, well, I have a friend who, if I ask her to do something, she will say yes, no matter what. And yeah. oftentimes not do it, right? Classic passive behavior, passive aggressive behavior, because she just does not i mean it, it the the culture she grew up the family she grew up in it was just not okay to say no 
And so now when I ask her to do something, I will say, here's the thing I'm asking you to do. You just respond with A or B. A means, yes, I will do it. B means, no, I won't. I don't, and that way she doesn't have to say no. She just says B. And it wor- it, is, it works geniusly. And I, and I think, you know, you could use that in a work context too. If someone is, you know, and, and maybe it's that they don't want to say in the meeting, no, I'm not comfortable doing that, right? So then you can say, okay, I'm creating a survey afterwards. Is everyone comfortable with the direction we took this in? All you have to do is click A or B. And then if people click B, okay, we're going to come back and discuss it, right? So I think it's just giving people... And and we get so caught up of like, well, why can't they just say it, right? Like I could spend so much time fretting about why this friend just can't say no, but I, that's not helpful. Like, again, I'm not giving her a prescription to therapy to sort this out. I'm going to just make it easier for us to communicate for me to get what I need and for her to get what she needs. Simple. Yeah. And making it simple to be able to do it, opposed to making it that, hey, you need to communicate. And what I realized from what you're saying is how much... I many times will expect people to communicate what the way that I'm comfortable mm, opposed to right. adapting to communicating the way that they're comfortable. That's right. Especially that's as a white American male, mm-hmm. there's a lot of privilege right here in that conversation. Right. Yeah. Uh, last two questions here. And I realize we're getting to the end of our time here is, yeah. so why should people make the investment in working on these relationships? Why not just leave the job? Why not just, okay, ignore this person? Mm-hmm. Why invest the time and energy to dig in and understand when I feel like this person's just being a jerk? Yeah. So it's a it's a careful balance of the costs involved. So the cost, we often think of the cost of, and and I'm very much asking people in this book to be the adult in the room, right? There, It requires you to take extra time, extra effort. Um, and those are real costs, but compare those with the costs of leaving the, your job and having to find another, or with having to constantly be dealing with this this passive aggressive person or trying to avoid them and get your work done without them, right? There are so many, and the research on this is so clear that people who have friends at work and however you define that, right? People have friends at work are more resilient. They get better performance reviews. They are more engaged. They're more likely to stay at the company. They're happier. They're just, it goes on and on the benefits. And then I don't think I even have to quantify the cost for people of dealing with someone who you have a negative dynamic. We feel it in our bodies. I mean, and there's, there's lots of research that shows being on the receiving end of incivility has physical consequences for us. I mean, it's, you know, Chris share in the book about the one that I like underlined and underlined was like couples who are in conflict who had a small little cut. Like it took, was it twice or three times longer to heal? Like, right. That was, right. that was a, <laughs> yes, right. Because think about it. Your body is preoccupied with handling the nervous system response of this, of this negative interaction, not doing its job, which is in that case healing, right. Or in this case, being creative or productive, or, you know, there's, there's so many ways it, it holds us back. Now I do want to say you should not stay in a job where you are just physically and emotionally exhausted and hurt every day. And there's, while I do ask people to be the adult in the room, I will also want them to be conscious of the fact that at some point it is the law of diminishing returns and you may not be able to make progress. You may not be able to change your viewpoint on the dynamic. They may not change. And I've heard some awful stories of how people are treated. And in those cases, I do think it's fair to move on. It's fair to say, no, I'm not going to invest anymore in this. I'm going to invest in me and my career and my well-being. Um, you know, I, I don't want anyone to get the sense that I'm saying, oh yeah, you can transform any, just put all your effort into it, right? I do believe that most dynamics can change, but sometimes your best efforts just don't work and it's time to do something else. Well, thank you for writing a book that gives people hope, right? Mm-hmm. And so here's something where somebody's dealing with this, where someone's feeling nauseous showing up to work or feels like there's no other way to deal with this employee that they have or this manager or coworker they have. And then what you've done is laid out a clear way to be able to identify 
maybe some of the attributes of that person, what I can do to begin to shift that and some concrete actions that I can take to be able to shift that relationship. And if it doesn't shift over time to realize that, Hey, it may not shift after I've tried all these things, but I know that I've tried. And I know that when I run into this person next time in my next job, because they'll always show up again, right? Always. I already have a place to be able to go to, to be able to figure out what I do, to be able to do it. Yeah. So Amy, where can people find your book? And what is, mm-hmm. I guess, lastly, what's your, what's your hope for this book in the world? Oh gosh. You know, you sort of articulated it that, that I really want people to have hope. And, and I, and I, there's a concept I talk about in the book called interpersonal resilience, which is that I want the handling of our most difficult relationships to give us the the resilience we need to navigate some of our even most positive relationships, because there's always going to be challenges. So I want us to be able to bounce back from the stress of these negative dynamics more quickly and feel more confident going into situations where there might be conflict or there might be a, a difficult person that that you that you have to deal with. Um, you know, and and I hope people find it useful. That the ultimately I just it's one of the things about being a writer or um, you know, working even on the podcast, you're often in these like tiny little rooms by yourself, typing away or talking away. And, and it's, I can't tell you the joy of hearing from people who actually have used what I've shared and it's benefited them. So, you know, that's my hope too, is that people actually are really find both hope and usefulness in the book. And, you know, I'll, I will take, I love, your articles on on accepting compliments and they've really changed the way that I accept compliments. So I will take your compliments and say thank you and thank you for seeing seeing the work that I do. You're welcome. And it's uh well I I just know that as we are talking today, I'm interviewing you and then I thought, oh what she just said that it completely applies to that situation here. I need to go have a conversation with this person because I realized the way that I reacted there. I had decided that the way I was approaching it was right. Mm. And so I think many times we don't see the impact that we're having. And so I know you made an impact on me and all the people who will be watching and hopefully reading the article that's going to be based on this. So thank you. And where can people find your book? Yes. So it is for sale. It's for pre-order now, but hopefully by the time this comes out, it'll also be on, on bookshelves and on digital bookshelves. So Amazon, your favorite bookseller, um, it should be, it should be in all of those places. They can also find it on my website, amyegallo.com. I've got a monthly newsletter. People can sign up for there as well. Um, yeah. And just uh, let me know what you think. You can reach me through my website too. So I'd love to hear from folks who have bought it and enjoy it and, uh, and follow me on social too. Wonderful. And if you've been impacted by this book, make sure you reach out to Amy and let her know the difference that it's made. Thanks, Amy, for speaking with me today. And I look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. This has been great. Thanks so much. Take care.